In the last video, we talked about the basic ideas of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and I closed with the comment that what we did was perfectly fine for 2 by 2s but wouldn't work for larger matrices. Just numerically, it's too hard to compute using the methods we were doing. So we want to try and develop a numerical analysis way of finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Very first thing, it's actually backwards from the way that we normally would do it. In previous courses, you learned that you solved the characteristic equation and you found the eigenvalues and then used the eigenvalues to find the eigenvectors. We're actually going to go the other way. We're going to find the eigenvectors first and then use the eigenvectors to find the eigenvalues. So in the last video, we were working with the example 4, 1, 2, 3, and we said that it had an eigenvalue of 5 and the associated eigenvectors. We said 1, 1, or any multiple of that, so anytime the two entries are equal, we've got an eigenvector. Well, what I'm going to do is just take powers of my matrix times some initial guess. So I'm just going to make a guess of 3, 0, and I take my matrix times it and I get 12, 6. Take the matrix times 12, 6, so I'm doing a squared times 3, 0, and I get 54, 42. Take the matrix times that 54, 32, or a cubed times the original, we get 258, 234. One more time, we get 1266, 1218. And notice that what's happening as we go on, these entries are getting closer and closer together, not in an absolute sense, but in a relative sense. The percentage difference between these things is getting smaller and smaller. We're approaching something of the form, a constant over a constant. So why is this doing this? Why is this happening? Well, first thing to notice is that the vector we started with, the guess, 3, 0, is equal to 5, or sorry, 2 times 1, 1 plus 1 times 1, negative 2. Why is this way of writing it important? Well, the 1, 1 is the eigenvalue for the eigenvalue, the eigenvector for the eigenvalue 5, and 1, negative 2 is the eigenvector for the eigenvalue 2. We didn't actually find that in the last video, but it's easy enough to do. So the whole idea Let's just go ahead and call these things V1 and V2. So this thing is equal to 2V1 plus V2. And because these are the eigenvectors, when I multiply by the matrix A, when I take A times 3, 0, I'm getting A times the 2V1 plus V2. So I'm getting 2 times A times V1 plus A times V2. And again, these things were the eigenvectors, so multiplying here by A is the same as multiplying by 5. So I'm getting 2 times 10, I'm sorry, times 5 V1 plus 2 V2. And in general, each time I'm multiplying by A, I'm getting another factor of 5 here and another factor of 2 here. So if I were to take a to the k times 3, 0. I'm getting 2 times 5 to the k times v1 plus 2 to the k 
times V2. So you can see, as I do this over and over again, this 5 to the k factor starts overwhelming the 2 to the k factor. This is growing so much faster than this, this is becoming insignificant. We'll go ahead and prove that and show exactly when this happens in the next video. But you can see for this example anyway, this becomes the dominant term. And so we're getting closer and closer to this kind of thing. We're getting closer and closer to 2 times 5 to the k times 1, 1. The entries are have to be getting closer and closer together. Okay. Now, so two things about this. One, because of the way this thing works, this is always going to be approaching an eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue. If the two eigenvalues were the same number or had the same magnitude, then this wouldn't work. We have to have a strictly largest eigenvalue for this to work. Okay. The other thing is that, well, this is kind of annoying. The fact that these numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's kind of a standard practice to, after each step, because this can be any constant in there, because any time we've got a multiple of an eigenvector, it's another eigenvector, we actually tend to scale things back. We actually tend to take things and we normalize them between each step. Rather than just strictly multiply by a, we divide each vector by its magnitude after each step, and that kind of keeps the numbers from getting out of control. Okay, well with that in mind now, let's suppose we've got an approximate eigenvector. How do we find the associated eigenvalue? Well, the big thing to realize is that because we only have an approximate eigenvector, we don't have an actual answer to the eigenvalue. We can't just say, oh, this is five times the thing, because it's not. But the whole idea is we're trying to find what's the best solution to this equation. What is the lambda that is the closest to this? But that goes back to all the least, norm, uh, least squares norm stuff that we did before. And what we learned back then is, let's go ahead and rewrite this just slightly. I can write this as x transpose, or x times lambda is ax. And the way we solved our least squares problems was we said, okay, if I multiply by x transpose, The solution to this was my least squares, the closest thing we could find in a least square sense. But x transpose x is just a, a constant. So that is my least squares answer. My best approximation for my eigenvalue is x transpose ax over x transpose x. So let's put all this together into a, something we call power iteration. We start with an initial guess, we'll call it x0, and then we keep iterating. Each first thing we do is we just normalize the vector, and then we say our next guess is a times that normalized vector. For that thing, we go ahead and we calculate what is the associated eigenvalue based on this thing here, which is called the Rayleigh quotient, by the way. And there we go. Actually, technically, we wouldn't need to calculate the lambda at each step of the way, but it is kind of a good way of keeping track of how things are changing 
through the iterations. We can see how much difference it's making in our associated eigenvalue. Again, though, this only finds the largest eigenvalue and its associated eigenvector. And there are certain conditions under which it works. It doesn't work all the time. So those are the things we've got to fix, is that one, figure out what are the conditions under which this thing works. And then also, how can we kind of find other eigenvalues and eigenvectors other than that dominant one?